Welcome to a new Café Rollist uh, in the, as part of our series Road to Session Zero Con, a week, which is almost upon us. It's next weekend on January 30th. And today I'm joined by someone not from the Philippines or Malaysia, a little bit further from Korea. Bam, could you introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bum Lee. Uh, I'm a Korean American artist, writer, and game designer, currently living in South Korea, in Seoul, uh, where I was originally born, but uh, I did not grow up here. I grew up in the US. Uh, I moved back here in my 20s, and I've been living here ever since. Great. Uh, we got uh, a couple of ice-breaking questions, because this, this is a spin-off from my main show, which was born out of the... COVID situation. Uh, what's your routine like at the moment? Is it impacted in any way by the the ongoing thing? Uh, me personally, not a whole lot. Uh, I do a number of different things, mostly uh, freelancing uh, as a editor or uh, writer sometimes. I also run a craft business with uh, my wife. So we teach, uh, my wife teaches macrame classes here in South Korea. Uh, so I help her with that business as well. We run the business together. Um, and uh, in terms of some things, uh, in terms of our business has been impacted like uh, live classes, or in my case, um, I used to run a lot of uh, in-person D&D games at my local game store. But since COVID, I've moved all of those games online. And at first, I thought that would be quite difficult for me because I've always just done tabletop games in person rather than any sort of online games. But um, I found that there are, I think, different uh, merits to the different kinds of gaming. And I've come to enjoy the uh, online aspect of it quite a bit. So I've been, uh, well, since COVID started, I've been running an online game. Uh, on a weekly basis. Yeah, it's the same for me, actually. Uh, I quite fancy playing online. It's n it's not the same experience. Like lately, we were baking at home and uh, yeah, we, we don't see anyone. We haven't seen anyone till uh, well before the end of last year. Uh, so when we're baking, we used to bake as part of having our tabletop games. So we would bake uh, something and share it with friends. So we miss that part. But when it comes to playing or running games online i actually like it very much i think uh, i think i'll probably continue afterwards i i have games around the tables now and then also but i think most of my games will remain online uh one thing that i really appreciate about online play is being able to play with people in other countries as well uh, before COVID started uh, i started a game with uh, some exchange students from france Oh. Uh, and due to COVID, they moved moved back to France, uh, and I've uh, and we continued playing together. Uh, for uh, one of the players is still playing with us on a sort of um, semi regular basis. So he, he's working now, so he can't play all the time. But occasionally, he, he does join us, uh, despite the time difference. <laughs> but he does join us from time to time. I need to ask you more questions about uh, those friends afterwards because I'm trying to find. Uh, French players, French, French TTRPG enthusiasts who've been a bit around the world so they, they can share their, their experience. Um, did you get introduced to Dungeons & Dragons while you were in the US or in Korea? I mean, I always knew about it in the US. The first time I played was uh, during, uh, I think it was middle school or high school, but we only played a couple of games before it sort of fizzled out. Um, I was actually sort of reintroduced to it through my ex-girlfriend, who's Korean, who turned out to be uh, a huge D&D nerd. <laughs> so she introduced me to her friends. And uh, when I was in Korea for a year uh, on a, a research grant, uh, I played D&D &D with, uh, with her and her friends uh, pretty regularly. And that was one of the things that actually helped me 
relearn the Korean language. Oh, wow. Uh, because at the time, I couldn't really speak Korean. I could understand a little bit because uh, my parents always spoke Korean in the household when I was growing up. But I always spoke back to them in English. Uh, but now here I was in a situation where um, I was kind of forced to speak. Well, not forced to speak, where I wanted to speak and understand more. So it was like really sort of um, an advanced level uh, speaking class for about a year. Yeah, the, I actually know someone in Malaysia, Keru Isham. He teaches English using role playing games. He is more fond of Star Wars. Uh, but uh, he teaches kids English, so I think tabletop role playing is uh, has a lot of potential to uh, to practice uh, a language. Um, in Germany, the most popular game is the One Ring. In the US, of course, it's Dungeons and Dragons. I've heard that in Japan, Call of Tulu is the most popular tabletop role playing game. What is it like in Korea? Is it sort of balance? Is it one game which rules them all? Uh, what does the the community likes to play? Huh? Uh, so I'm sort of partly involved in the uh, Korean uh, tabletop community here, um, but I'd say I'm probably a little more involved with uh, like some of the expat communities more so. Um, so I'm not probably not the best person to ask about like an overall view of the Korean tabletop scene. Although I'd say from from my perspective, uh, it seems like D and D is quite popular, but Maybe Call of Cthulhu is a bit uh, more popular or a bit more uh, widespread. Um, that game store I mentioned is, is run by a friend of mine uh, named Joey, who's from the States. And uh, he mentioned the story to me where uh, someone came in asking for a Call of Cthulhu dice. And it took him a long time to realize that the person probably just meant polyhedral dice for gaming. And they just referred to it as Call of Cthulhu because that was their point of reference for tabletop games. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that you know everyone's like that, but I think uh, outside of the U.S., especially uh, Call of Cthulhu seems pretty pretty broadly, inter uh, you know, popular uh, internationally. In some places, I think you know, more so than than D and D. D and D here certainly has its its you know fandom. There is um, Adventures League here uh, uh, among the Korean community as well. Um, but I think maybe Call of Cthulhu has had uh, better, uh, maybe better translated books. I'm not really sure, but uh, just more uh, maybe a, official support or published support for a longer period of time. I just uh, I'm being told by Sang Jun, uh in the chat room. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. That uh, yet again I got a connection issue, so I'm gonna turn off my camera. But I'm still here. There you go. Uh, okay. So, at some point, you made the jump to writing uh, tabletop RPG adventures and, and maybe some games too. Uh, uh, how did that happen? Uh, what brought you to to this? Uh, so, I think it was sort of a, a gradual process. Um, so, I've been keeping a website where I write campaign journals of. Uh, the adventures I run, um, you know, which include published adventures and also uh, homebrew adventures that I that, that I made, mostly in the Eberron setting because it's it's my favorite Dungeons and Dragons setting. Um, so I started. Uh, I think that got me practiced uh, with writing a little bit more, uh, writing down my you know, ideas and my interpretations of different hardcover adventures and thinking about the possibilities of where those stories could go. Uh, and they, uh, and then this year, um, I started trying to run games for more people, uh, because a friend invited a friend invited, you know, you know how it happens, right? Uh, and then suddenly I had like too many people that I couldn't all run games for at the same table. So, uh, I had kind of a crazy idea. Why don't, why don't I get another DM to run the same adventure with me, an adventure that I make? Uh, but then I realized in order to do that, I have to actually write the module for them to, you know, run the game off of. And, and that got me like practiced with, um, that gave me a chance to practice writing a module for someone else to run. Um, and I think that was a really good experience for me. 
uh, which might be a little different from, you know, say if I just had an idea for a module that I wanted to write and just publish somewhere for an anonymous audience. I mean, I had a chance here to write an adventure that I knew was going to be run by someone in a week. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. And so, yeah, and so I, I had to, you know, uh, and some of it involves feedback with the DM that I uh, that would be running that adventure because it was like on a rotating basis. I had a group of DMs who were willing to, do, to try out this crazy idea. Uh, so that gave me a, a really good uh, chance to, you know, get feedback and uh, sort of figure out what areas uh, were kind of weak or uh, needed improvement. So I, yeah, so I think that helped a lot. And those became some of the first uh adventures i published on the dungeon masters guild uh so the first uh ones that i made were uh called the branches of time which is a series of time travel adventures set in the world of eberron cool um did you so you said you you're not that uh integrated in the, the korean community uh, what about the, in in South Korea? Uh, it seems that in the US there's a there's a Asian community which is growing more vocal, which is a great thing. Uh, through shows like Asian represents and other initiatives, uh, did do you engage a lot of uh, with with co uh, Asians and Koreans uh, back in the US or in the US? Uh, I mean, not in the US so much. I actually used to run bilingual games in Korea. So I'd run games with uh, like maybe say half Korean players, like Korean Korean players, and then uh, the other half were American players. And uh, one of my freelance, as I mentioned, I did do a couple of different jobs is I also work as a freelance interpreter now, uh, mainly for uh, film and animation festivals because I, I studied animation in university. Um, and so, uh, I uh, sort of using some of those skills, I, I ran these bilingual games where the players didn't have to all be bilingual. They didn't have to speak uh, English and Korean. One side would speak Korean, the other side would speak English. Uh, and I would like I would translate between them during, during the game, um, which was, was um, I mean, I, I really enjoyed it personally. I enjoyed the fact that uh, I was able to be sort of like, this might sound kind of cheesy, but sort of a bridge between people across a language barrier, uh, people who otherwise really wouldn't be playing Dungeons and Dragons together, uh, and, and sort of um, like creating an opportunity for people to uh, play the game together, you know, across across that language gap. And um, you know, for Koreans who wanted to maybe learn a little, practice their English a little more. And expats who wanted to pick up some more Korean, there you know there are expats here who've been here for a number of years for a long time. It was, it was Koreans actually quite good, um, but I think they maybe don't always have an opportunity to uh, speak Korean with Koreans because a lot of times they're here working as English teachers, where their job is to to speak English to engage their students in English. So I think they they enjoyed that aspect of it as well. Yeah, you you're entirely right, and it's kind of a situation you see in a lot of countries. I mean, I was an Anglophile before I moved to London, but when you move here, through you know circumstances, you tend to be surrounded by other expats and immigrants rather than than locals. And uh, tabletop role playing is definitely one of the few uh, opportunities, contexts where you can easily uh, engage with with locals uh it's it's amazing that you you make that translation bridge uh i, I was just editing an interview with someone from Ke quebec uh in french canada and they were explaining how uh some of their table run in both french and english and sometimes the, the players don't understand one another but it becomes a an element in the story D did you make that an element in the story like i don't know some of them would be from different nations in the games and that's how you you sort of dealt with the, the translation uh, challenge? I didn't actually. I've seen that done by another game master uh, for uh, for like a one-shot game where that was... So he ran a game where he had uh, two groups of um, players from two different language groups. And they were sort of... Um, they began as 
uh, players, uh, or they, their characters began as being on opposite sides of a, of a uh, conflict, but then they eventually have to work together. Uh, and he, uh, I think he, he made that uh, kind of interesting, but I never really did that too much personally. What uh, I, the benefit that I found from running a, a bilingual game was that um, it actually gave me more time to think. <laughs> Since I'm saying everything twice, basically, uh, it gives me a chance to say it once and then sort of reorganize my thoughts a little bit as I'm speaking the second time. And I guess it kind of gave me a chance to buy more time in a natural way. Um, when I went back to playing just like, uh, you know, running games in English for uh, uh, just a single language table, uh, I found that I kind of missed that aspect of running a bilingual game, just having that extra bit of time. But I don't think it really slowed down the game too much for the players. At least that's the feedback I got from uh, some of the players I asked. Do you feel like it slows the game down too much? Or do you feel like it, you're not you know, enjoying it as much as a single language game? Um, and for the most part, I think uh, it didn't really feel that way, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, in French, we like to translate, the, for instance, the names of the creatures in Dungeons & Dragons. So we've got Tiranoi for Beholder. And meanwhile, in Portugal, apparently, they, they don't bother doing that. They, they hate actually translating stuff. So they just say, they speak in Portuguese and in the middle of the sentence, there's the word Beholder. Uh, do you have words for creatures in, in Korean or do you just use the English uh, ones? Uh, so again, I'm not, uh, I don't actually have the Korean D&D uh, &D 5th edition book. Uh, I have uh, the, the starter set. Uh, I got the starter set when they were doing the, uh, the crowdfunding for that. Um, and I really should pick up the core books. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think in terms of the monsters, uh, what I'm aware of is that they, they did translate a lot of the monsters. And maybe, I think there maybe were some that they didn't. So it was kind of back and forth. I know that for the class names, they transliterated everything. So they just called a fighter a fighter. Um, I'm kind of more used to like, a, like an older, uh, I think translation system maybe, because the people, the first people I played with were um, like, they described themselves kind of like as like the first generation Korean D and D nerds, uh, like like uh, my dungeon master was um, he he was a, uh, at one point a, a game designer by by trade as well, uh, and he started playing D and D like in, in the nineties when uh, friends would like bring books over from the states and you know like they, they were all just like figuring out how to how to do it at the time and uh, like they didn't have any dice so they told me they they like folded their own polyhedral dice out of paper and rolled those wow uh, and like. It's a crazy stories like that. Um, and they had like, they made their own translations as well. Like they, they translated and found their own books so that they could, they could play Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, a lot of those older uh, translations that they made translated those classes and a lot of other things too. Uh, so yeah, I think um, that's one thing that I, I try to be, that I, I need to be better about in terms of, uh, you know, if I play with uh, like Korean players, again, to try to uh, be more on top of like the, the terminology in Korean that, that they might be used to rather than just kind of, uh, you know, leaning on the terms that, I, that I'm used to. So going back to your work, I see on the, the Dungeon Masters Guild uh, website, and I will link it in the description of the episode so people can purchase it. And if they do with this link, I will get a little, a few cents <laughs> so people can support my show. Uh, but uh, I see right those of the Cyclops, Sa Saving Salvation, the Crimson Carol, the Lover's Potion, I think it's you also. Uh, which one would you recommend people should rush towards? Uh, which one is your favorite, you would say? Um, well, I think I like all of those just for uh, different reasons. The one that I'm running at session zero is uh, Riddles of the Cyclopes. And um, all of the adventures I have up on the Dungeon Masters Guild right now are uh, Eberron adventures or Eberron compatible, including Riddles of the Cyclopes. 
So uh, Riddles of the Cyclopes, I wrote when the Theros book, when uh, Mythic Odysseys of Theros was coming out. And I wanted to try writing something that could be used in uh, multiple settings. So, uh, you know, on the 10, it's, it's about riddles and involves a cyclops or a cyclops rather. The cyclops, uh, the plural refers to a cyclops and other one-eyed creatures. Um, and so uh, you could play it as sort of a generic, maybe kind of Greek themed game, whether it's set in the Theros setting or not, but it also has uh, more specific uh, adventure hooks and conclusions uh, for Theros, the Forgotten Realms, and also for the Eberron setting. So uh, at session zero, so you're gonna run. Are you gonna run several sessions of the same scenario, or just one? Are you gonna have a, a booth? What are your plans for this weekend there? Uh, so I'm actually going to be uh, kind of going back and forth between two booths. Uh, one is riddles. Uh, one is my own booth where I'll be running one session of riddles of the Cyclopes. The other is a booth for uh, a small community of uh, Korean uh, tabletop uh, game designers or uh, up and coming designers, uh, people who are just kind of getting into uh, tabletop game design right now. So this is a, a completely uh, online community. Um, and uh, they are uh, right now working on a series of small uh, adventures, small one-page adventures called uh, one-page dungeons. So it's, the idea is that the whole dungeon can fit on a single uh, printable page. Uh, and yeah, so uh, I'm going to be running one of the uh, one-page dungeons written by one of the other members in, uh, in this uh, community. And the community is called the uh, RPG uh, Creators Club. So the, I know yourself, you're not on Twitter, but you know, RPGC, they, they made themselves noticeable uh, over there on Twitter. Uh, is this group or any other Korean group um, with uh, have a, a, a Twitter hashtag like RPGC or if someone is looking for Korean creators, they should look at RPG as well because uh, RPGC, Southeast Asia, as far as I understand, uh, <laughs> Korea is not exactly in Southeast Asia. Right, yeah. Um, so uh, for uh, the RPG Creators Club, uh, I did make a website for the community, um, but mainly it's, it's just a placeholder at the moment. It's something that, uh, that we're working on and we need to develop some more. At the moment, it's, it's all in Korean, partly because um, one of my goals for this was to actually try to create more Korean language uh, content. Um, and uh, so, you know, due to this opportunity with uh, Session Zero, uh, I will be um, putting some English text on there just as an explanation of what this project is, what this community is. But um, I'm hoping that uh, this community will be uh, kind of a way for uh, Korean designers to create more uh, original content in the Korean language. Because there's a lot of tabletop content in Korea, but a lot of it is translated. A lot of translated games, uh, you know, translated from English or from, uh, you know, Japanese. There are a lot of JRPGs here as well. Um, but uh, I have, well, I have not seen a lot of, um, you know, Korean uh, language, uh, original tabletop content. Uh, now, one uh, ex one exception, one notable exception, is a an independent uh, game designer named Sang Jun, uh, who actually has also has recently signed up for a booth at Session Zero. So you'll be seeing him there as well. Uh, and he uh, recently crowdfunded uh, a very nice uh, tabletop game uh, called uh, Moonflower, uh, which is based on uh, tarot tar tarot cards, so tarot. Uh, so he, you know, takes inspiration from like the, you know, uh, from the, uh, the major arcana of tarot, uh, and uh, sort of created a game based on that. Um, I think the game that he is going to be showcasing at session zero will probably be a, it will be another game, so it will not uh, be that. But uh, that that is a very nice game. I think I have that here actually. Uh, so yeah, I'm, pl I'm plugging another. 
author right now at this point. Sorry about that. But yeah, actually, so Sanjun is, uh, is in the chat room and he's very, very happy oh, that you. <laughs> here, here you go, Sanjun. Here's your, here's your plug. <laughs> so this is a very nice book. I mean, and the artwork in this is, is really, it's, it's really lovely as well. So yeah, um, my, my cat wants to see it too. So yeah. I won't show you the whole thing. You'll have to, uh, Gorgeous. to find it and buy it if possible. But yeah, it's really nice. It's, and it's it, the rules, as you can see, are in, are in, can you see here, it's in English and Korean, which I think is, is amazing. I mean, that's just amazing, amazing. That's great. It's interesting that uh, apparently there's not such a, a, a big tabletop RPG creator scene uh, in Korea because, you know, I always see TTRPG like an extension of popular culture to some extent. So France, they got their thing going on. So they, they got their own TTRPG, the UK, they, they got that. And and Korea, you are such a... I mean, from the outside, you look like such a, a powerhouse of entertainment, especially today. You've got cinema, you've got TV with K-drama, you got K-pop, which is really thriving. So... There's definitely something missing there if there's no... Uh, by the way, Sangjun was suggesting to start using the hashtag KTRPG, I think. Is it what he... Oh, that'd be nice. Uh, yeah. that, that'd be nice. Uh, so, yeah, that would be awesome to, to have more of it. Uh, but it's surprising that there, there's not uh, there's not so much yet, or at least you're, you're not aware of it. I think it's more that I'm probably not aware of it, honestly. <laughs> um, and when I show you, show you this, I'm, I'm specifically talking about things that are uh, published and, you know, more widely uh, accept, accessible, um, like, uh, you know, published systems, published adventures and things. Uh, people certainly do, do write adventures and, and do, uh, you know, uh, run lots of really creative, really original content. Uh, I think a lot of it uh, is, is more confined to, like, online communities. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lot of it is... Uh, you know, what you might call just homebrew rather than um, like an like you know indie game publications. So I think uh, that's that's one difference. Um, so uh, like one of the things that I'm trying to do with the uh, that hope will be uh, possible with the RPG Creators Club is to uh, create more published, like specifically published content, and uh, to kind of um, you know show that. Uh, hey, this is something that you could, you know, you could potentially try to do for a living if you if you're really passionate about it. I know it's difficult even for, uh, you know, uh, like English uh, speaking or English writing creators on the Dungeon Master Guild to, to, you know, to to make a living off of that or uh, or to, uh, you know, pursue that full time even. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I do know that there are people who do it even if it's difficult. So. Um, and there's there's certainly you know beyond that space even or just like the wider you know there's just so much um, you know publishing and uh, so much great work being put out there that uh, I you know I'd like to see more of that kind of um, you know, more of those publishing uh, publications coming out of, of Korea as well or and, and just reaching like a wider audience rather than uh, you know staying within just like the, the Korean internet sphere. Yeah, we, we had a, a whole panel dedicated about how do you find your space online and on the global stage, which is English speaking, when your community uh, itself, it, you sort of, it really feels like, and I think that's what's happening with RPGC, it really feels like you need, you need to develop a strong, robust local community and then it can become a platform to try to to reach out to the outside but you need to sort of find your own market uh home uh, before you you're able to i know so um right now uh we've got there's a kickstarter for all shores which supports three projects uh, from the philippines and malaysia on kickstarter but i know that at least from the Philippines, it's actually illegal to use Kickstarter. Do you know if there are similar crowdfunding platforms in Korea and if it's actually legal for Korea Koreans to use the, the American platform? Uh, I think there's no um, you know issue of it being illegal or anything. I think it's uh, the challenge is more an issue of maybe like transferring funds. 
mm-hmm. uh, between American platforms and, and Korean ones. So there's a there's a uh, Korean um, counterpart to to Kickstarter, uh, which is called Tumblebug, and a lot of creators use Tumblebug to to uh, you know crowdfund uh, projects. Uh, Unflower was uh, crowdfunded through Tumblebug as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and uh, you know translations are are crowdfunded through that as well. The uh, the D and D fifth edition. Uh, translations were crowdfunded through uh, through Tumblebug, uh, I believe, and uh, you know other projects as well. So uh, each time I've got a guest who's really into D and D, it's kind of my my classic question to ask: uh, uh, Have you tried other systems and uh, maybe Korean systems or systems you think uh, you would like to develop with in the future? Um, I've looked at other systems, um, and I, I feel like it's kind of a, a failing on my part, honestly, that I have not uh, run a lot of games or explored a lot of um, other systems. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I've run like different variations or different editions of D&D, but, uh, and, and, you know, Call of Cthulhu, which is, which is you know, quite similar. Um, in terms of like a, the basic, you know, raw mechanics and stuff. Um, but yeah, I actually have not run a lot of other, you know, different systems, which, which I hope that, you know, at some point um, I can, you know, rectify. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just very, um, very used to D&D. And uh, I feel like there are a lot of you can do a lot of things with with any system really and it's just a you know a matter of how you use the uh tools at, at your disposal i suppose um and the other thing is like the the community of the people around you i think uh, i mean the, the people that i play with uh, you know uh the friends that i play with um they, they all enjoy uh D. they all enjoy dungeon dragons fifth edition uh and so yeah um you know, I'm, I'm always open to to trying new things at at uh, at some point, but yeah, just always kind of wondering when that will be. <laughs> the well, that's the thing right now. The with moving online, that's also an opportunity to to try new games in a in much easier fashion. If you want to run them, it's easier because you have more chances to to find players and if you like me you like to run games but you're very lazy when it comes to learning systems or even just reading the most basic book so what i do is i join games i learn the game by playing it uh mainly at the gauntlet but like at the beginning of the year uh i made a call for a couple of games uh, including brindlewood bay which i really recommend uh, it's um uh, i don't know if you know the show murder she wrote uh so sure. yeah you you play old ladies investigating and uh, it's spoiled by the apocalypse it's very simple it's it's very simple yet at the same time to to counter what you were saying it really achieves things that you cannot do with call of cthulhu or dungeons and dragons so you don't have all your rules to do everything but what it does it really it really makes the experience specific and special uh, so I learned that one online and now I'm probably going to try to do my own hack. Um, and uh, yeah, very soon uh, in February, again, there's a, there's an open go- community day, gaming community day at the Gauntlet. So uh, if you want to try anything, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, stuff on offer. And they're never stuff for which you need to need the rules in advance. Usually the, the game master uh, teach you uh, everything you, you need to know. Um, are there other projects you wish to discuss or, or, or topics since I'm running out of questions? <laughs> uh, well, I guess going back to, um, you know, why I don't run uh, other systems, um, if I'm being like really kind of brutally honest, the big part of it is, is laziness on my part. Um, but another issue is it really is time, uh, especially since I started writing adventures, I found that, you know, like, Time is such a, a precious resource. Um, like dividing time between, uh, you know, making a living, doing doing other work, but also trying to write adventures and trying to, you know, prep and run adventures. Um, 
and it, it's just you know sometimes it's uh it's it's tough it's tough juggling so many things and and you know like um if you're doing like a broadcast like this i'm sure you know this also um for someone like yourself this also takes uh, you know a lot of uh, preparation and you know time organizing things and you know getting people to uh you know come on the show so it's um you know it's it's, it's tough juggling uh you know so many different things yeah it is um, and but you know the thing is with D, which sometimes uh, people are missing it's designed that way you know it's an ecosystem so it's made to capture you and keep you it's like if you compare it to something different it's like if you start buying apple products or samsung products or androids it's all designed in a way which tells you no 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 stay with us stay with us and and well, yeah when you play when you you play D or a, a big game like that uh not that other games are smaller but uh yeah, it's it's almost intentionally complicated. So it feels like everything will be as complicated to get on board to, which is not quite true. And again, D and D is there, and the community is there to keep you inside and tell you, oh well, you want to play something? Sp you want to play a heist? Well, here's Dragon Heist. You don't need to try Blades in the Dark. You can uh, play that in Five E, which is not entirely true. But I think there's there's really a big difference in terms of. And again, it's it's not it's it's designed this way by wizards. Uh, as soon as you have tried a couple other games and you realize that uh, actually it's not that much work, especially if you're not the game master. Uh, once you try the second one, it's much easier to try a third one uh, and so on. I mean, I had the experience at the club here. I was running an old version of Star Wars, Star Wars D6, which is really simple and had players ahead of the the session asking me okay where's the player's handbook or what rules do i, do I need to read uh, read and i was like i never read anything before joining any of the the hundred games i played because I'm, i would i would not be playing anything so but when you play the D &D, it feels like that that you will need to learn all these things all over again to learn a new system and call of duty is a bit like that also I'm preparing for a Call of Cthulhu stream at the moment, but but really most games you you can trust the game master to to do what, what you need to. Yeah, um, but that actually a... that is very true. All the things that you're saying right now, it's very very true. <laughs> it's not a criticism. I I know it, it's always comes across as uh, judgmental or, or snobbish when I, I recommend to to try other games, but it's I mean. There's, there's stuff like like Brendan Woodbear, for instance, uh, came up with a brilliant idea for resolving investigations. And, you know, if you played this little game once, you can even come back to, Co to Dungeons & Dragons or Call of Cthulhu and say, well, I could run things a bit like that. I could take these rules and, and use it for D&D. So in Brendan Woodbear, the, the way the investigations work, you know, the issue when you play something, you've seen the movie Sherlock Holmes and you're like, oh, that is so good. I'm going to run that in a role-playing game. And you lay your clues, <laughs> your players miss half the clues, and then even if they have seven <laughs> clues, none of us is Sherlock Holmes. So you got seven clues and you have no idea what's going on. Well, what I really like with Brindlewood Bay is that the idea is, so the game is to find the clues, you find the clues, but actually the game master has not decided who's the who's the killer, for instance, if someone got killed. What happened is that the players, they all got all their clues together, they come up with a theory, and based on the number of clues they have in their theory, they make a roll, they got a bonus, the more clues they use, and then you find out if their theory is right or wrong. But the game master did not decide that in advance. You you discover it. So and that's something you could do in, in Dungeons and Dragons. And that's just an example. Inventory yeah. in Blades in the Dark, for instance. I don't want my inventory to be in, like any other game than Blades in the Dark. No, you you don't decide what's in your inventory. You know that you've got a, a list and you can tick things on your list and you got a maximum of ticks you can do in your list. But during the game, you decide, oh, I had the rope. 
and there's a flashback where you fetch fetch the rope. But so yeah, the, there's stuff like that which I think would benefit Dungeons and Dragons. So yeah, that's why I'm trying to always advocate for that. Yeah, um, and you're very right that uh, you know they they do create uh, like you know these ecosystems um, that are kind of like all encompassing, I suppose. I think um, in terms of writing for you know the Dungeon Masters Guild or uh, like Miskatonic Repository or those sorts of uh, community uh, you know writing programs, that's what uh, you kind of end up you know you tend to lean into that yeah. more so like you, you lean into those communities and uh, try to you know write things that um, you know would would appeal to them or you think might appeal to them or. Um, at least appeal you to yourself as like a member of one of those communities. So um, I suppose on, on the one hand, it is like, uh, you know, like they, they're like, they're kind of keeping you in the, in the system, plugged into the system. But, you know, on the other end, I think there is like the community aspect of it as well, or like feeling like you're part of like the larger community, I guess it's a, it's a matter of perspective. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's sort of carrot and stick. And it's so the, the dungeon, the master guild is a good example of that. It's like, no, 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 no. You don't need to go on drive through and be exposed to other games. Just stay here and it will be <laughs> all D and D just for, for you. And no, 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 no. You don't need to go sell your D and D adventure elsewhere. Just stay here and we'll, we'll support you. But this way you stay here and the people you attract, they stay here as well. And we all great right here. <laughs> Why go see elsewhere? Why go on itch.io or drive through or you, you don't need to just just take close to me here's a little program with a badge just so you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, i got richard yeah. from the d20 future show who asks um what's your sort of process when you design an adventure do you come up with a, an arc and then fill it up or you start from the beginning or do you have an idea or how did you sort of write the, your adventure so far? Uh, I think it's been different for uh, each adventure. Um, so one of the first adventures I sort of uh, uh, wrote, or rather came up with, but didn't actually write down, was uh, was a, a lover's potion. And that was um, uh, for a Valentine's Day one shot. And that game was kind of what got me back into uh, running games at, at like a local game store after a long uh, uh, hiatus. So this, despite the uh, what the title might suggest, it's not actually well, it's not it's not mainly about a a love potion. Although there is an element of that. I know that can, that is kind of a a controversial uh, issue, but it's it's more about a certain uh, alchemist and like the the terrible uh, mistake that he makes um, and the uh, Adventure is more about, you know, kind of uh, dealing with the with the mess that he makes. Uh, but yeah, so for that, it kind of uh, ran the game. And then much later, I sat down and actually thought, okay, if I was going to write this as an adventure, how would I write it? Because when I ran it, a lot of it was very improvisational. I was kind of, um, you know, like what you were saying uh, before about the mystery, uh, uh, running a mystery game. I was kind of leaning into the player's assumptions and their guesses. So, uh, you know, at one point, one of the, uh, I actually hadn't really fleshed out the villain of the story when I was running the game, but one of the um, players suggested, uh, based on the way that I was describing him, um, I thought maybe he was like some sort of zombie or something, but uh, one of the players said, maybe he's a warforged, like he's a sentient uh, construct. I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. So maybe he is a Warforged. And then the story sort of developed based around that. So that's one thing that I uh, made sure to include in the published adventure, that the nature of the villain is kind of, um, it's kind of open-ended or can be open-ended. That's something that Dungeon Master can set out at the beginning, but it's also something that they can kind of, um, you know, improvise along the way. Because for the most part, uh, this is kind of a spoiler, but for the most part, you don't really see the, villain's identity until towards the end so that's kind of a reveal but it's something that the dungeon master could uh while they're running before they're running the game have decided in advance or something that they um could uh you know let the players just determine for themselves um some of my other adventures i tried to uh to just sort of write from the, the ground up um uh like one of the uh 
adventure, uh, one of the uh, products I wrote for uh, the Eberron Adventures League is uh, is called um, uh, what is it? it's called Saving Salvation. It's actually a, a series of three shorter adventures that are designed to be uh, salvage missions or uh, adventures that you can kind of uh, plug into like the main Adventures League campaign. Uh, since that's one of the uh, writing uh, community writing programs and in, 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 within the Dungeon Masters Guild, like writing for writing salvage missions for the Eberron Adventures League campaign. Um, so th those were designed with a specific uh, you know objective in mind, having these uh, as you know being salvage missions that are kind of more modular or things that they can uh, can be incorporated into the larger campaign. Uh, and as I described earlier, uh, the time travel adventures I wrote, um, those I, I wrote specifically, I actually had run those at, as homebrew adventures first, but then when I was running those adventures again for a new group of people and with a new, with a second dungeon master each time, uh, helping me run for a larger group of people, I was specifically writing uh, with that in mind, uh, trying to write something that uh, would be, um, you know, runnable and it, it enjoyable by uh, the group of people that I'm that I'm playing with right now. So you are comfortable with the the concept of quantum auger when you game mastering or playing something? The concept of what? Uh, quantum auger. So I, I'm not sure how popular th this image is, but the, the idea of a, a quantum auger for when you are game mastering. So. Uh, if uh, you're picturing a, a room in a dungeon and there's three doors, uh, sort of a, a sandbox approach would say, well, door A, you've got a treasure, door B, you've got a trap, door C, you've got, a, you've got an ogre. So that's sandbox. Everything is defined in advance. Railroady is to say, well, I want to, the player say, I want to open door A. Oh, you cannot open the door. I try. No, you can't. Oh, I try door B. You can't either. Door C. Oh, you find an auger behind the, the door. So that's railroady. And then quantum auger is that, okay, you're in a room. There's door A, door B, door C. Okay, I open door B. Well, there's an auger behind it. <laughs> because you, you 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 decide sort of so so it's sort it's a, in a way it's railroady but it's called a, sort of flexible railroady you you make it so that you you decide it of the order that the player is going to be exposed with the ogre the trap and and the treasure uh, of course this should be supported by information if you gave them information that the ogre is behind the yellow door they should be behind the, the yellow door, but uh, it's it's sort of the concept that you adapt your thing, so it's kind of smoothly. You still control the story, but in a in a loose manner, and of course, it's about doing it in a subtle way. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, don't tell my players, but that's pretty pr probably pretty much how I run games in general. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know, um, it's really I think when you're running the game, it's more a matter of hiding those rails or making it feel like the players have agency or making it really feel like their choices matter because you could run like a totally sandbox game and none of the choices seem to matter. Right. I mean, uh, whatever door you open, something happens, but unless it's dramatic or unless it seems to, you know, lead to meaningful consequences, I mean, why are we exploring this dungeon in the first place? Um, as a, whereas uh, sometimes a, a railroad adventure can, um, feel pretty like you can still feel like you have an impact you know you uh, it's more a matter of how you go through the railroad rather than like the particular path that you take sometimes it's, it's more about you, the, the smaller choices that your character has an opportunity to make along the way that I think uh, make to make a story really uh, memorable sometimes yeah you, you curate an, a story for for your player so it's about them having the best experience and that includes going along with their choice but also sometimes just not exposing them to something random for the sake of being random if it doesn't serve the the purpose or sort of the beat structure or this sort of things uh we're getting close to the one hour mark uh, is there something left you'd like to discuss uh well i 
Um, well, I'd like to thank you for inviting me, uh, you know, on the show. And this is uh, this has uh, been really fun. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that uh, I didn't talk about so far is that I'm also a uh, 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 event organizer for uh, Adventures League games on occasion. Oh, cool. uh, in in uh, mainly for the Ebron Adventures League. Um, because, like I said, I, I just really enjoy Eberron as a setting, uh, and the Adventures League uh, campaign that, uh, that they're writing right now is also really great. And the the epics that they wrote for it are, uh, especially the, the second one, Rolling Thunder, which we ran recently as a a smaller uh, event ep uh, epic event here in Korea, as an online event since you know we're still in the midst of um, COVID right now. Um, it was a smaller event than we'd hoped for, but I think the players who, who played it really, uh, really enjoyed it. Um, and so that's, that's another thing that I, um, that I, I do sort of on a less regular basis, but something that um, I uh, like to you know, continue doing as well. And um, these are also, um, I always try to run, run those as, as charity epics as well. Uh, in one of the uh, organizations that we try to uh, support regularly, is the Korean Unwed Mothers Families Association. Uh, and you can find their website at uh, kumfa.or.kr uh, if you're interested. Um, and they're an organization that uh, supports uh, single mothers in South Korea and their families. So uh, with these charity epics, um, I usually try to support that organization as well. Um, aside for that, from that, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to session zero and uh, meeting all the people there. Uh, and having a chance to uh, run uh, Riddles of the Cyclopes and the One Page Dungeon by uh, a member of the RPG Creators Club for people at Session Zero. Uh, and I'm just so you know, glad to have that opportunity as well. Great. Well, uh, if there's a place where people can easily find your games on the Adventure League, so because, again, uh, Sadly, it's online because you cannot play in person at the Adventure League, but that means that anyone in the world could join one of those games. So I will include, send me a link afterwards. Uh, I will include a link to your Facebook uh, in the description of the episode, and, and I will include any link to your, not only your games, but also uh, anything you you organize or where people can can find it. Sangjun was posting something, kumfa.org.kr, so I'm going to uh, include that there. Uh, are there other places where people can find you online when you wish to be found? Uh, did you create that Twitter account yet? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, working on it. <laughs> no, uh, well, mainly uh, on my website, just um, bumley.com. Uh, if you type in bumley.com slash games, it'll just take you to a page with uh, all my uh, Dungeon Masters skilled games, uh, all the adventures I have on there. Oh, um, I, I am also, like this year, I uh, am also participating in a number of um, collaborations uh, as well. Um, I am actually contributing artwork to uh, one of Sang uh, Sangjun's projects, a uh, project called Laureate. Uh, and um, that sounds I am French. Also, I also, yeah. <laughs> It's a it's a game of uh, uh, poetry, words yeah. of beauty, uh, and so I'm contributing uh, artwork to that. Uh, I also contributed some uh, writing to uh, another product that's coming up uh, out in the Dungeon Masters Guild soon. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Weird Artifacts I Found in the Guild. So it's it's a huge tome of uh, like a hundred artifacts made by all these uh, made by a number of uh, different, uh, very talented Dungeon Master Guild uh, authors. So that's, uh, you can look for that uh, pretty soon as well. Um, other than that, I am also uh, contributing to uh, one of the volumes of the uh, Unbreakable uh, series. Uh, you know, I, I can't talk to in too much detail about um, the particular uh, thing that I'm writing for that yet, but. Um, uh, I think it, it's okay for me to mention that I, I am uh, contributing to it in general. So yeah, that's something else I'm working on. Um, and yeah, uh, so I'll be posting those on my Facebook. Uh, you can just uh, find me uh, on there as well, Bumley uh, Games on, on uh, my Facebook page. But uh, I'll also be posting those on my website, bumley.com. So yeah, that's the, the main place where you can find me online. 
Great. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'll definitely, I mean, the, I, I got too much going on at the moment, but uh, I, I definitely want to record more stuff with uh, uh, fellow table top RPG enthusiasts from, from Korea. I've been, I think it was with Sengjun, maybe it was somebody else with, from Korea, but I've been discussing uh, the possibility of doing a film study, RPG Academy film studies, about a, a Korean movie or two. I mean, there's, there's so many very good Korean movies to inspire you. Tabletop RPG actions. So, so yeah, we'll, we'll, pro we'll definitely have uh, stuff happen. Thanks again uh, for joining me, uh, Bumley, and uh, I look forward to uh, probably running into you at uh, RPGC this weekend. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Cheers, bye. Have a good night or have a have a great day. <laughs> have a good whatever. <laughs>